Hello everyone. Hope you guys are doing good. Today we're going to resume our discussion on path planning of robotic manipulators. Remember, last time we observed quite a few of those examples. We got motivated and we found out what are the basic ingredients of such activity. So today is the time when we start digging and observe how to execute such activity. So let's start the discussion. We identified that this planning exercise is actually the process of breaking down the desired movement. Into what? Into discrete set of motions. And in that quest, we will make sure that we satisfy movement constraints and we possibly try to optimize time, energy, or some other aspects of the movement. And why we perform this whole activity? Because we need to find a path from start to finish. So the basic idea is to ask your end effector to start from somewhere and reach the finish point or end point. But in that, the path is needed to be identified. Now, obviously, you can see that if you have two points in the workspace, uh, there may be infinite different ways in which you can reach to the final point. Uh, you may take a route something like this. To achieve this uh, finish point or end point, you may have, let me use a different color. You may take this route. Uh, alternatively, you may have uh, something like a straight line traversed from start to finish. So that may be uh, possibly an optimal route. So in that context, uh, obviously the issue is that uh, you are going to find a path, but is it feasible? That is going to be one major question. Now, the other question is that if it is feasible, is it going to be optimal? Are you going to conserve resources in terms of energy or in terms of uh, time? Uh, you wish to achieve the final point in the, in the minimum time possible. So that optimality or other aspect of optimality may be uh, of concern for us. So you need to have a planning done for that. Now, on top of that, there is a possible a scenario where you have obstacles in the workspace. So in that particular context, for example, if I use uh, uh, an obstacle over here, right in the uh, optimal path that we have defined. So in that case, you have to avoid hitting this obstacle. So that would be an additional uh, aspect added in it in the planning exercise. You need to take a D route. So that may take this kind of shape. Uh, so avoiding the obstacles or avoiding the collisions is going to be another important aspect. But the issue with that is that the obstacles, just like the one being shown over here, obstacles are going to be defined in the workspace. Now, uh, but the robot has got this uh, uh, constraint that it is going to only understand its own configuration. So you need to uh, kind of separate the notion of workspace uh, with configuration space. So how are you going to separate the two? If something is defined in workspace, just like obstacles or some uh, other aspects of, of, the, of the task to be handled, how are you going to map on to the configuration space and how are you going to jump back to the workspace? So that is going to be an, an important aspect to be considered in this whole planning exercise. Now, on top of that, the issue is that as you grow uh, the degrees of freedom in the robot, uh, you are going to grow in complexity of this exercise. So that complexity is going to be an important uh, aspect to be considered in this whole activity. Now, on top of that, uh, you need to make sure that you avoid singular configurations. Now, singularity is something that we have already covered uh, in previous exercises and previous discussions. Uh, so all that discussion is going to remain relevant in there as well. 
uh, if you recall, we said that uh, uh, whenever you have singularity, you may have uh, uh, a difficult mathematical scenario. In that case, the determinant of Jacobian was equal to zero, which means that the rank of Jacobian uh, was uh, reduced. So when you have reduction in the rank, it would mean that the rows and columns of the Jacobian are going to become linearly dependent. What does that mean? It means whatever is happening in the joint space may not directly map, be mapped onto the, uh, onto the uh, task space or workspace. So that is going to become a difficult issue to be handled. So you need to avoid singularities as well. And that is an additional motivation to perform the planning exercise. And obviously in terms of its its uh, solution, you are going to find uh, multiple different ways. Dozens of different ways are very popular in planning exercise, but obviously this is not the time and space to cover all of these uh, approaches. We will only cover the major uh, approaches. And in that, we will cover uh, potential field methods. We are going to cover gradient descent methods. And in the probabilistic domain, we are going to cover the probabilistic roadmaps. So this is the task that we are going to uh, perform, and this is uh, the motivation behind this whole exercise. Previously, we discussed quite a few examples, but the one we discussed in much more detail was this pick and insert exercise. Initially, the problem presents itself in this fashion. Then the robot using all of its links and joints together gets closer to the object, starting from the home location. Once it is very close, it opens the gripper up and performs this operation in a very careful fashion. Once grabbed, it takes the object to the other place where it is needed to be inserted, but this operation is needed to be performed possibly or potentially in a time optimal fashion or conserving energy. And if there are obstacles in the middle, it needs to avoid those as well. But when it gets above that, that place where it is needed to be inserted, it then once again performs this operation in a very careful, slow fashion. Then it inserts the object in the space provided for that. In nutshell, you can readily identify that this whole activity is needed to be planned in a methodical fashion. You have to ask your robot to start from a home location and reach to the proximity of point location A. But this path is needed to be collision free and this activity is needed to be executed fast enough. In the middle of this activity, you have to find out each and every point like a reference signal. This reference signal, by the way, the controller will resolve it into the joint space reference signals. But that is another story. But once in the proximity of point location A, the robot has to perform this activity in a very careful fashion so that the orientation of the wrist and the gripper arrangement, whether it is opened or closed, is properly taken care of. Once the robot has grabbed this component up, it is needed to be shifted to the other location, but that activity is also needed to be carefully planned. And in that, you have to ensure that the obstacle-free uh, assurance is there and time and energy consumed in this whole activity is also accounted for. But once it is closer to the point location B, once again, you need to be careful. And that careful operation is necessarily needed because this is an assembly operation, which will further require certain compliance and certain other uh, arrangements to be ensured. So you can see now that this whole activity in the application that we have chosen for this whole discussion is when decomposed into smaller segments, it, it contains quite a lot of information which is needed to be uh, well understood. So in this context, you're able to identify different states, the starting state, the final state, and all the intermediate states. You're able to identify the time of execution as well. Somewhere it is fast, somewhere it is slow. And you're able to identify different actions, some of which are state-valued functions, just like opening the gripper or closing it down. Somewhere these are continuous functions, just like controlling the speed of this movement by having a coordinated action executed. And what is going to be the plan, whether it is a reactive plan or a global path planning exercise has been done. 
And this plan is going to be executed alongside the criteria, whether it is optimal, time optimal, or energy optimal, or whether it is feasible. And all these things are going to be correlated with the plan. And then sometimes the additional constraints are added, just like while inserting the pin in the hole, you have to be extra cautious. Uh, maybe you require compliance in the wrist. So that uh, that is going to be added as an additional constraint in the in the whole process. So these are the basic ingredients of any planning exercise and that you have to be extra careful while performing this whole exercise. In non-industrial settings, we observed this example as well, where room cleaning robots were discussed. So in this exercise as well, I can identify the basic ingredients of this planning exercise. And that is going to be embedded in the robot as an algorithm, a planning algorithm. So in this particular case, the criteria would be to cover the full floor space without leaving any empty space or void in it. So for that reason, there is going to be certain criteria which, which the robot must fulfill in order to achieve the task. But once that criteria is there, then it has to execute certain actions depending upon the states. So from the starting state, as the uh, problem presents itself, the best possible way is to go to the north direction. So it goes north. And when it reaches over here, uh, which is going to be detected like an intermediate state where the sensors are going to indicate that now you have uh, a, a different state achieved, then it has to change the action, obviously. So that action is in this particular case going to the west direction. But since the criteria is embedded in it to not leave any space unclean, so it has to take another turn. So it takes a turn in the south direction. It goes south intermediate state, action is changed. Intermediate state, action is changed. And in that particular fashion, it keeps on doing this operation, cleaning the full space in an appropriate planned action. So in the middle of it, it is going to account for all the intermediate states, uh, keeping in view the sensory information being recorded, and then it has to perform this action in a, in a time optimal fashion. But what is being observed on the left hand side, you can see another robot which is doing something else. So the planning exercise uh, in this particular robot is a, re is a reactive but random exercise or, or, or an algorithm which is going to go randomly wander uh, uh, in, the, in the space provided. So if it goes here and there, it might leave some empty space up. So that is going to become problematic in the long run uh, because it, it is going to uh, drain its batteries very uh, quickly. Uh, so you can always kind of try to find uh, the different situations, the task space to define what kind of ingredients you would like, like your robot to possess. And that is going to be embedded as an algorithm in the system. And now we can shift our focus on the concepts of workspace and configuration space. So the first term to be introduced is that of workspace. Workspace is defined as volume swept out by the end effector. Now remember, I'm using the word end effector in that, in that definition. So let's assume that you have a robot. This robot is going to using all the uh, joints and links together. It is going to assume uh, different shapes. So I'm, I'm saying that in a kind of a specific case, uh, you have n link robot all the way reaching to the end effector. So while defining the workspace, I will only consider this end effector to be point of interest. So this end effector is going to sweep a volume and I'm going to only consider that volume to be the workspace. But for that, I will consider the inertial frames or not moving frame, uh, like the reference point for that. Now remember, the robot is going to be uh, having all these uh, links and joints connected together. 
uh, possibly N-Link robot. And that is going to define the configuration. Now, what I would say that I'm going to highlight with a different color now. Uh, this robot going to have a joint over here, another joint over here, another joint over here, another joint here, 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 and here. And I'm going to label them with cues that we have already used. So this is going to be Q1, Q2, Q3, all the other cues. Four, five, six, and so on and so forth. So in that particular sense, the configuration is going to be uh, consisting of all the cues associated with this manipulator. And now you can see that with different colors highlighted over here, uh, that uh, yellow is indicating the end effector and blue is indicating the blue points are indicating the configuration. Actually, in, in true sense, uh, all the points in between these joints are also considered to be part of the configuration as well. But uh, since we are going to use uh, uh, the denovert hartenberg convention later on in order to ease the computations, so we will not be overly bothered about what is happening between these joints generally. But if that situation arises, we may kind of get one step back and assume all the points in the middle of it or some points in the middle of these joints to be a part of the configuration as well. But that's not the quest over here. Uh, at this particular stage, I will just consider uh, the joints, which may be revolute or which may be prismatic joints. So these cues, all these cues are going to define the configuration of the robot. And the uh, end effector highlighted in yellow is going to define uh, how the robot is going to perform the operations in a workspace. So the volume swept out by uh, the end effector shown in yellow is going to be the workspace, but the configuration is somewhat different a concept from that. Now in this continuation, when we have defined the configuration in blue highlighted joints, I can now define the configuration space, and that is going to be set of all possible configurations. So this robot may assume numerous diff different configurations. So all those possible configurations are going to be called, uh, when combined, the configuration space, and it is denoted by Q, capital Q. And why we are defining these two things over here? Because remember we said earlier that the obstacles and generally the tasks are defined in the workspace, whereas the robot is going to understand its own self in the configuration space. So you have to be careful that how the task which is defined in the workspace is mapped onto the configuration space. So that's why this distinction and this division is needed to be understood so that we may use it to, to plan better paths. And now we can define obstacles. Since obstacles can be numerous, so a union of all the obstacles are going to be defined with capital O using this expression. Now remember these obstacles are going to be defined in the workspace. So keep a note of that because you have to then map the workspace onto the configuration space. Now, since we have to consider the robot as well, so that's why we have to define the robot. So we are going to denote the robot as A using the configuration Q. So in this continuation, we can say that the configuration space obstacle is going to be defined with this expression. QO, which defines the configuration space obstacle, is accounting for that configuration Q, which belongs to the configuration space, such that the robot at that particular configuration, when intersected with union of all the obstacles, does not produce zero results. So this is the definition of configuration space obstacle. Now this is how you're going to map something which is presented in the workspace onto the configuration space. Now in that continuation, the free configuration space is going to be the space where 
I would not have the risk of hitting the obstacles. And that is going to be defined using the same notation over here, that the free configuration space is defined to be configuration which belongs to the configuration space such that robot at that configuration when intersected with union of all the obstacles is going to produce zero results. So this is going to be further defined and illustrated using examples, but this definition is going to serve the purpose uh, or, or uh, serve the basis for identifying uh, or guiding the robot not to go to, the, to those places where obstacles are and keep itself over there where there's no chances of hitting the obstacles. And the simple rule is that if we know the configuration space obstacle, we can just avoid those configurations. So now we're going to go through a few examples to illustrate that point. So the very first example that we are going to consider is that of 2D Cartesian manipulator. But before we get into there, we have to identify what is being presented in front of us. So you can see a workspace is being shown over here. So this is a 2D workspace available to us. 2D in a sense that you can see the x-axis and y-axis in which the manipulator has to perform the job. The Cartesian manipulator is constructed in a fashion that only its end effector is present in the workspace as shown in the circular format. So this is the end effector. And this decision has got direct implications uh, because uh, in this particular example to start with, we wanted uh, not to be hindered by the configuration of the robot. So that's why we have chosen this end effector to be the only component of the robot present in the workspace. And there is an obstacle as well, shown in black. So this is the obstacle. Now this obstacle is defined as a complex polygon inside the workspace. And obviously you can now understand that the end effector must not hit this obstacle. So the task is going to be in that sense to identify uh, what are going to be the configuration space obstacle which we wish to identify and not allow the robot to get to those uh, configurations. So if the end effector has to perform its operation in the workspace, it must be able to access all the points in the workspace. It must be able to reach over here, over there, in this corner, in this corner. But as it gets closer to the obstacle, like the point being shown over here or, or highlighted over here, you can readily identify, although the center point of the, of the end effector is away from uh, the obstacle itself, uh, still it is going to be hitting because the end effector has got a boundary associated with that. So that's why it is going to potentially hit the obstacle up. So that's why I would say that I'm going to uh, highlight this space as uh, part of the problem. This space. This space. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, the obstacle which is in the workspace defined it by its own boundary by its own boundary may not be the obstacle size that you are going to observe in the configuration space. So from workspace to the configuration space, if I'm going to make a jump, I'm going to see that this obstacle, which has got a specific boundary, a complex polygon shape, it is going to grow bigger because of the red shaded area that I've highlighted uh, over here. So this is this area is going to be included in the configuration space obstacle when I'm going to jump from workspace to the configuration space. Just observe it now. So this is where you can see that from the workspace to the configuration space we have jumped and I can see that the obstacle which was defined 
by its own geometry in the workspace is now going to show itself uh, in a in a in an exaggerated or an inflated fashion over here because of the shaded area that I indicated previously as well. I'm going to reshade it just to make you realize that. So this is going to be included in the configuration space obstacle. So in that sense, I can say that this uh, black area can be considered as configuration space obstacle. And the remaining area is going to be Q free. And these are the, the important concept, concepts uh, which are going to be important or relevant when you are going to jump from the workspace to the configuration space. And that must always remain uh, in your mind whenever you're, you're performing this path planning exercise. Now, this is a slightly modified version of the previous example. In this case, the end effector is now going to have a polygonal shape as indicated over here. Now, if it is a polygon, it is going to have vertices. Uh, so you can see that while navigating around the obstacle uh, OI over here, uh, different vertices are going to be interacted at different corners. For example, in this corner, you can see a different vertex is getting interacted with the obstacle. Over here, for example, you have a different vertex. And if I draw it, at a different corner like over here. Let me draw that. Now this is a different vertex getting interacted. So in that sense, you can say that when you're going to jump from the workspace to the configuration space, when you are going to make this jump, the configuration space obstacle is going to be presenting itself in a slightly different form. So keep a note of that that it is also going to be dependent on the shape of the end effector in this case, uh, which is going to have a different shape of the, uh, of the configuration space obstacle. So this is uh, an important point to be considered whenever you're going to jump from the workspace to the configuration space. But the big question is that how we are going to define the algorithm for this activity. Uh, we can start from end effector. And effector is defined as a convex polygon. And in this case, you are going to have the vertices of that polygon, like A1, A2, A3. Depending on the shape of the polygon, you may have more than three vertices as well. And these vertices are defined corresponding to the frame of reference of the body as shown in here. So this is the frame uh, with respect to which these uh, vertices have been defined. Now, on top of that, uh, generally, we define these vectors normal to these lines connecting uh, the vertices. So this is going to be uh, a vector normal to the line connecting A1 and A2. So in that case, you have to make sure that this is going to be 90 degrees. Now, this vector has been defined uh, with a specific nomenclature, it says vector one of n vector a. Uh, so this uh, is one of the vectors. Similarly, you're going to have another vector, the third vector as well. Now, in a similar fashion, you are going to define the obstacles as well. Uh, so you can see the vertices of the obstacle like B1, B2, B3, and B4 visible. Now, on top of that, you are going to have these vectors normal to the lines joining these vertices as well. So you can see one of the vectors over here, V1, O. The subscript O is indicating that it is corresponding to the obstacle. Now, uh, there may be a scenario where you may not have uh, convex polygons. You may have non-convex polygons. Uh, and uh, I may make you recall that, that uh, if you have internal some of the internal angles to be more than 180 degrees you are going to have the non-convex polygons so what you can do in that scenario is to subdivide the situation into a two or more than two uh, convex polygons so you can always subdivide one non-convex polygon into convex polygons so you can once divided you can still be 
uh, applying the same principles over there as well. And then you can define one of your algorithms like this, that for each pair of the vectors corresponding to the obstacle, like defined in yellow over here, like for example, for V1O and V4O, if for this pair of vectors, any of the vectors corresponding to the end effector, which is defined in green, like this, or any of the other vectors over here or over here, if this vector points between negative direction of the vectors corresponding to obstacle, then you are going to do what? You are going to add these vertices in the configuration space obstacle. So this is going to be an incremental process in which you're going to make use of a for loop. And this for loop is going to contain all these conditions over there. So for each pair over here, you are going to check whether this condition that we have defined are fulfilled or not. And if yes, add in the configuration space obstacle uh, if that condition is fulfilled. Uh, and if you keep on doing it, keep on doing it, covering all the spaces, uh, uh, then obviously you will have the configuration space obstacle identified. And then obviously you can uh, define the algorithm like this as well, that uh, you can do the same exercise considering uh, the vectors corresponding to end effector and trying to find out what happens with the obstacle. So that can be uh, also executed as well. So this is one of the algorithms to identify uh, the configuration space obstacle when you have defined your end effector as well as obstacles uh, the, to be convex polygons. So in, in that sense, uh, this uh, exercise can be encoded and executed so you can try that as well. Let's now discuss a different application. In this case, you have the robot placed inside the workspace over here. Now, you can see the obstacle over here. You can see the manipulator, which is a two-link manipulator already indicated. Now, on top of that, uh, you should also register that you have this condition to be fulfilled as well, that Q2, which is the second um, angular displacement, is kept constant at zero. Now, in that particular scenario, if I wish you to consider how the workspace is mapped onto the configuration space over here, you can readily see that when Q2 is kept at zero and Q1 is changed from a zero position, so you are moving on this line incrementally. So you're moving from zero all the way to, to, to two pi. Now in that particular scenario, you can see that uh, zero is uh, aligned with this horizontal axis. And uh, uh, when you make half of the rotation, it is going to be pi. And then you're going to have similarly diff other quadrants as well. So you can readily see that when this arm which is moving with Q2 is kept at zero. When it is moving in the third quadrant over here, it is going to start hitting the obstacle. So somewhere after the mid of uh, this scale, where you have pi, uh, after this, you are going to expect that uh, the, the arm is going to start hitting somewhere starting from this point uh, all the way to possibly this point it is going to keep on hitting uh, the obstacle uh, shown in black. So that is going to be when Q2 is kept at zero. What if I then decide after I've made this one run, I decide that Q2 is going to be uh, changed to incrementally to some higher value. So this may be like 0 0.1. When you do that, it would mean that you have bent this elbow a little bit over here. Uh, so in that case, you're going to uh, make another run uh, and expect 
that there is going to be some other area where uh, the arm is going to hit the obstacle. So in that particular scenario, if you keep on incrementing uh, this whole uh, Q2 and uh, completing the runs on the Q1, you are going to map uh, like a two-dimensional uh, uh, portrait of how the uh, configuration space is going to be mapped, including the configuration space obstacle. And when you do that, it would be something like this. And obviously, you can right away see in this particular case that uh, this obstacle, which is hashed now in yellow, uh, is uh, presented in the workspace uh, when mapped onto the configuration space, which is visible on your right. Uh, you can see the same obstacle is presented in this configuration space to be hitting with the manipulator. So this is going to be, in that particular scenario, the no-go area. So this is going to be configuration space obstacle, and you would like your robot to not achieve those configurations, those values of Q1 and Q2 where it is going to have uh, the collision with the obstacle. So whatever is other than that, the complement of uh, that is going to be the Q3, and this is where you can allow your robot uh, to, uh, to perform. Now in this particular discussion, I can readily see that this is only for one obstacle. What if you have more obstacles, or what if you have the, the shape of the obstacles changed? So in that case, the, the uh, the mapping is going to be uh, somewhat even more complex. So let's see that. This would look something like this. And if we have some more complexity added to it, the complexity on the configuration space is going to get even more complex. And you can see that uh, some, uh, some spaces like this are uh, where you would not find any way to get into there. And obviously you can see that for very simple straightforward two-link planar manipulator, the complexity of this task is growing bigger. Uh, so what if you have three-link manipulator? What if you have n-link or six-link manipulator? Then obviously this task of mapping the workspace onto the configuration space is going to be very complex or at least computationally heavy. So we would love to have some method which avoids that explicit definition of obstacles or, or configuration space corresponding to those and Q3 as well. Uh, so that is going to be the task in the subsequent arrangement. Uh, so in nutshell, we can say that if the complexity of the manipulator is not that big, we can map the workspace onto the configuration space. But if that is not the case, then you have to find some other ways to achieve uh, the planning exercise. So in this context, and to avoid the complexity that I've just mentioned, now we wish to find a path from initial position to the final position. In such a case that these initial and final positions are defined as vectors in the configuration space, where initial configuration is QS and final configuration is generally labeled as QF. And in that case, we have to avoid uh, the configuration space uh, obstacles. So in that particular sense, we are going to develop a sequence of discrete configurations uh, which are going to drive the robot uh, to start from the, the starting configuration all the way to the final configuration and in that case avoid the obstacles. So in that case, it would be a map, a map from start to, uh, to final configuration uh, and in that case, we must uh, make sure that it is in the Q3. Uh, and in that case, it would be a sequence of discrete con configurations. Uh, so this is what we're going to uh, uh, pursue in the next part of this lecture. Uh, so, But at this particular stage, I can say with confidence that we have seen a couple of ways in which we can uh, map the workspace onto the configuration space, which was one big hurdle or one big important concept to be cleared. Uh, uh, and now we have seen uh, a, a few complexities associated with that kind of exercise and in the next part of this lecture we are going to try to resolve those complexities by uh, further exploring this uh, arrangement where a sequence of discrete configurations is going to be defined uh, in the Q3 
which avoids hitting with the obstacles. So this is it for this part. Uh, and in the next part, we're going to continue the discussion. So this would be end of part two. And in part three, we are going to discuss the potential field method.